Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitch Slevic from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I'll be your virtual host this evening. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science is pleased to partner with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management and the Denver American Indian Commission to present Indigenous film. As you watch the presentation tonight, please put your questions and comments in the chat. We'll be watching the chat throughout the event, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And so first of all, to start the evening, I'd like to introduce Thomas Allen from the Denver American Indian Commission. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, there's This is a great, great uh, festival, and I am honored tonight to welcome everybody to uh, you know this evening's uh, performance. And I hope everybody tonight uh, enjoys this, uh, this film and all the good things in it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and moving right along, I would like to introduce the uh, director of the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival, Jean Rubin. Welcome everybody, glad you could join us. Uh, as, as always, I like to start with uh, thanking our sponsors. Uh, we have um, our 2021 series sponsor is Mile High Behavioral Healthcare and our media sponsor is Kubo Jazz Radio. So a big thank you to them uh, for helping to make this festival possible. Uh, we've, we've had this monthly indigenous film series going for a number of years. Uh, it's been, uh, had been an in-person, in-theater event at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And they just did a tremendous job um, stepping up to help us uh, transition from an in-person theater program to this virtual program. So a big thank you to them. We truly could not have done this without all of their expertise and technical assistance. One of the advantages um, with these Zoom programs is it's given us an ability to bring in audience uh, from much further afield and also the ability to bring in speakers who, as, uh, as Mitch said, could not have driven from Hawaii for a Wednesday night <laughs> program. Um, but uh, we, we're really uh, thrilled about that. Uh, with me here is Merv Tano. He's our Institute president. president. He is also uh, a commissioner on the Denver American Indian Commission. Tonight's program, The Last Opelo Man, is uh, a Hawaiian film. Uh, and we have two special uh, co-sponsors for tonight. Kumu Lao Foundation is a Hawaiian-led organization uh, helping to bring this program to you tonight. And also we want to thank Living Ocean Productions for making the film available to us. With us is the last Opella man, uh, Uncle Chuck. And uh, with him is uh, Krista. Krista, Krista Johnson um, will be joining us for the Q&A after the film, but we'd like them just to say a quick hello before we get into the film. So the mic is yours. Next year's Chuck. <laughs> Sit up. Hi, everybody. And I want to thank all you folks for coming tonight. And maybe I can get you folks on the boat with me as we look, you know, run the film through. <laughs> Mahalo Nui Loa, and we can talk story later. Okay. Yep. Mahalo. And again, I just want to thank Jean and Merv for one, finding Bryce, finding this film and having us. This is the second year we've participated with the film festival and we had so much fun last year. We're really honored that you invited us back this year. So big Mahalo. Yeah. Oh, our pleasure. Um, yeah. We've, uh, we screened this film uh, with Krista and Uncle Chuck joining us for Q&A for the uh, Jeffco um, Indian Education Program, which was a wonderful program. And we wanted to bring it back um, for a broader audience through our uh, Denver Museum of Nature and Science and Denver American Indian Commission collaboration with the monthly Indigenous Films. So with that, the film runs 15 minutes. You will get a wonderful introduction into uh, the things that Uncle Chuck is doing. And then we'll be back for Q&A. So, Without further ado, we will roll the film. I wanted to start up uh, with the Q&A before we, 
uh, move to uh, uh, see what uh, other folks have uh, uh, questions they might have uh, typed in the chat. Yeah, I don't see anything no. in the chat. We're good. There was a, uh, when I was growing up uh, in Hawaii, we're not, we're not fishermen or anything like that. But one of the things that uh, uh, we, we, we learned about was, uh, you know, they used to have the old uh, uh, tuna boats going out of uh, uh, the Kewala Basin. And uh, it was this mostly Japanese uh, fishermen with that uh, with that hook that didn't have any barbs, and and now it's huge vessels from China and, and other places. So you must have uh, in, in your time, Chuck, have, have seen changes not only in uh, kind of the technology, but kind of attitudes and, and societal changes uh, as it relates to Opelo fishing. Can, can you say a little bit about those changes that you've seen? Yeah, we got, we got, nowadays you got so much changes, you know, it's not like when we started way back that all the fishermen, you know, work together, but now, with the younger generation coming up, you know, they, they don't want to work with the old timers. They don't want to jump ahead all the time. And that's okay too. It's a different way of, you know, fishing. But in our ways, we always think of the, the next guy, you know, but this new generation is not about the next guy. It's all about themselves, you know. So that's, that's the way that it's changing Hawaii so differently from when I grew up, you know. All the changes of fishing, the way of fishing has changed so much that it's more modern now. Because when we started, it was all hand line, you know, no rod and reels. We troll with hand lines, and now everything is with electric. All reels, all electric. So you don't really work out there. You know, you just turn the switch on, pull the fish up, gaff them, whack them in the head, throw them in a box, you know. Our days, you pull the fish up. One ah, he he he'll take about 600 feet of line when he first bite, and you had to pull him up by hand all all the way. Comes by the boat and he'll hit the boat and he'll run another 600 feet of line, and you have to pull him back up. But today everything's modern, all electric, so you don't work too hard as a fisherman like how the old timers did, yeah. Hey, Merv, do you want me to, um, we have a few questions coming in for everybody. Um, so people were asking if there's still fish in the waters. Yeah, Opelu is not really, as much as people think it could be overfished using the traditional methods that the Opelu fishermen still use here, it isn't overfished. Um, I think with what we're seeing with what we consider climate change is this year, because we have so much fresh water from rain, we're not seeing the Opelu come in um, so we're thinking it might be a salinity issue with the waters, but we never really know. And then um, since the first showing of the film, have we seen a rise in interest in your traditional form of fishing? You know, not really. <laughs> yeah, not, not really, because there's not too many people want to really fish for Pelu, but there's, you know, part-time fishermen, but the true full-time Opelu fishermen is only about six of us right now fishing full time in our area. You know. And mostly in the west side of the island, of our island that uh, we fish for Pelu. Yeah. Yeah, we found, um, Chucky and I have been teaching this for, since 2013 we started um, because uncle had a, what we call a kahea, a calling in himself to not lose these practices because Hawaii Island had the one of the worst uh, crystal meth, meth problems in the United States from the 1995 era through about 2005. So we kind of lost a whole generation of people, which it, it was across everything. It didn't matter if it was hula or levaya fishing, mahi'ai. Um, 
this newer generation in their 20s and 30s is trying to sort of recover that. But unfortunately, what happens is like uncle's 80 years old. He could never teach somebody how he learned now from the age of five, right? From the age of five on. And um, so, you know, it's depressing, but we don't stop. We keep trying to reach out and, and teach as many, like we both teach up at Ahu Nui Caimolino. It's a South Kona where we live, immersion school. Um, uncle's now a First Nations Loose Foundation Fellow for 2021 to 22, along with Kumu Ali'i Mitchell and Hina Lemoana Wankalu from Hawaii. And so, um, you know, we've been able to build our net school and he has a few apprentices. So those are all updates and good things. We also are super involved with activism now with a lot of the cultural practitioners with which we serve. Um, yeah, I think though that Levaya, the fishing isn't, it's not like, what we understand right now is Anakala, Chuck is the only one teaching this concept or these methods outside of his family. Because it's usually this is only kept within the family. It's never taught outside the family. But he's the only one in the state of Hawaii who actually has this kind of a teaching program. There are other islands doing certain things, but um, the feedback we've gotten is that there's just not a lot. And a lot of people, this is hard work, right? People don't want to, they don't want to do it. They say, oh, it's a lot of patience, but it's really boring. And maybe like 50 kids we teach, we have one, one who might want to learn. So, but it doesn't stop us. And I know, let's see, you want to say anything, Uncle, while I read questions about that? What you think? Well, I, you know, I think nowadays the young kids got all these iPhones. So it's much more fun playing with the iPhone than, you know, making a net, you know. <laughs> And you have to have a lot of patience when you make net because when I see them make net, you know, I mean, so eight to 10 hours, I just make net. And I don't think of anything, but I, I got it now, you know, seeing the young ones that are coming up with all the different gadgets coming out for them. It's more fun doing that than what I do. So. Um, do we fish using the moon phases? Um, so Uncle always tells people, I don't use the moon, but then we realize we fish by tide or current, which is ao, A-U, ao is a current, but of course that's governed by the moon. But do we do use the um, traditional Hawaiian moon calendar? Not really. Um, Opelu is a seasonal fish and there's the traditional kapu was usually like kind of around the month of February to August, but it's really a, a floating kapu where the fish just actually won't eat. So you can't catch them when they're not not, um, they're usually spawning, so they won't eat. And then, oh, I see someone said they grew up on the east side of Kauai. So a good friend of ours is Dennis Aguchi. Dennis Aguchi teaches over there and fishes Opelu, and he learned from your dad, right? Yeah, he came here. A lot of guys, you know, tell, it's a lot of guys learn from your dad, right? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people came, and my dad taught them, and uh, Dennis came here, and we took him out and showed him how to do Opelu, and he's, I think he's probably one of the best Opelu fishermen in Hawaii right now. It's, I guess there's a lot of fishermen there too. But he's, yeah. he's a nice guy. And then um, people want to know, are there any other places where Opelu can be found? So Opelu is just scad mackerel, right? So we have Opelu and Akule here in Hawaii. Opelu is scad mackerel and the Akule is big eye scad mackerel. So probably anywhere where you've got mackerel, but what you have here that I don't know if you have in other places is we have what are called koa, right? Uncle, can yeah. you explain koa? Yeah, koa is, uh, I guess, you know, the Hawaiians found the koa many, many years. And it's a funny thing that- What is it though? It's underwater, it's, right? It's just, it's nothing different underwater. It's just coral, some koa is a coral and some koa sand and coral, but, but it's, it's a place that this opelo always come back certain time of the year and they always go there. It's almost like when the salmon come back to, to the place that where he was, they were born. I don't know if opelo does the same thing that, you know, they go out and hatch and then the young ones come right back to where, where the old ones were. So I, I really don't know how, the, how that does that work. But. Yeah. And the, the koa in the old days, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Hawaii and the, the old traditional is, we have what are called ahupua'a, which are within districts, like our mokua districts, like we're in the district of Kona on the island of Hawaii. And within that you have divisions, land divisions, the ahupua'a. And it was basically for the most part, they were what we call maukatamakai. So they started up the mountain and they went all the way down to the sea. 
and whoever was in that ahua, you know, they utilized it. And the ahua actually continued out into the ocean and covered these koa. So there's a big movement now, like down south of us, we have Mililii Fishing Village and Ho'okana Fishing Village. And they're in the process of doing what we call community-based sustainable fishing areas. It's a big movement in Hawaii um, under the 30 by 30 initiative, which is 30% of the coastal, uh, coastal um, lands are governed by 30, you know, basically communities. Um, so anyway, there's a whole big movement happening, but it, it's, um, yeah, the koa are an interesting thing because in some places it's been lost, like on Oahu, where you have many generations of it being lost, the tradition, just because of the, you know, the incoming tourists and people who bought up areas and people don't have access anymore to the shoreline. Whereas on this island and like Hawaii, we still pretty much have it. Um, let me jump. So somebody was asking if teachers at the school that can or could teach. No, not really. That's, I mean, I've been up at Ewanui Kaimalino. I'm teaching first grade this year and uncle teaches Ho'onui Ike, but with COVID, that's all kind of shut down. Um, it's such a specialized tradition. What we're going to try to do under the, um, the fellowship funds that we received from First Nations and Moose Foundation, um, we built our school, our own home school. And then also part of that is going to be creating a a workbook with video and um, you know type to try to document this, but it's kind of hard to if people don't know how to teach it. Reading the book isn't really going to help. Maybe it's kind of like yoga or something. If you don't have an actual teacher, you're never going to understand the real practices and the um, the subtle practices. Like I I fished with you for several years as what he calls the kai man. That's your second person who helps you throw chum and pull fish in. And I'll tell you, you learn things just standing in his presence of what you see and can't see. And, you know, so I don't know about that beyond what we're trying really hard to document. Ceremony or celebration around the first catch of the season. Were there traditionally? Not really for you guys. Did you celebrate it when it opened? No. No? We, <laughs> we, we gave away a lot of fish when it opened. But probably it's a celebration or not. Yeah, it, fishing was fishing. For yeah, us. you know, it's so hard to say. I've lived here 30 years. So I got to see this village when it was actually a fishing village. And there were only a couple of us Howleys living here. Um, so when we would, the Akule would come in a couple of times a year. That's a big, huge net surround we do out in the bay. The whole village would shut down. Everybody had a role to play. Everybody was fed. Um, yeah, so the ceremonies, Opelu, you know, as far as what we've been able to see in the old traditional one, because we have Hikiao Heiau down here. Hikiao is where the Makahiki celebration actually started in the Hawaiian Islands, um, when they would do the Makahiki and gather and collect the taxes. Um, but Opelu, that doesn't really vibe with the Opelu season. And also fishing, it's a silent practice. You guys didn't talk, right? No, it's, it's hard, you know, because when we learn, the time we learn, you, you have to be there and watch, but they don't talk to you much. You have to learn by watching you know, your eyes and, and just and the paying attention. And you, know, and you have to just sit there for hours and hours and hours. And that's why we never did come up with a lot of net makers you know, after the generation changes because you know, there was less patience in the younger generations. And then there was you know, much people don't want to do that. So that's why we stepped, we stayed in that area that we kept going. But other than that, today, I still find it hard to find people who want to make that, you know, and take that tradition on. Yeah, it's also exposure. Like, you know, you look at um, Hokulea, the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and Nainoa and those guys. Nainoa is a neighbor of ours. And then Uncle Chad Paishon and um, Pomai. Bertelman's dad and Chuck were good friends. They are, they've been doing this for so long and been out there that people understand more about voyaging and, and learning those arts that they learned from Mao. Um, same thing with Hula, you know, Hula didn't die. You know, Uncle George and those guys, they really, really brought it back as did King Kalakaua, so it didn't get lost. But things like the fishing, some of the farming, um, you know, even the, we have low hollow weavers, we have stuff, but the, these smaller arts, they're not as out there. So it's, um, it's a shame because I think a lot of these older kapuna or elders are dying and a lot of that tradition dies with them. And a lot of us are scrambling to try to preserve it. Um, and the only thing with ceremony is whenever we make a net for somebody, uncle, there are certain practices when you first use the net 
that involve what you do with the first catch that you have. So we always share that when people get nets from us or learn how to make net. And then somebody's asking, can the koa be federally protected on your island? Um, yeah, that's a big argument because it's three miles inside to three miles out is actually state, right? Um, so we're all kind of working on that. That's part of these community-based fishing areas that we're doing that will protect that to a degree. We're fortunate that we don't have an onslaught of people trying to fish Opelu, um, but that's changing. This after with COVID, we've had an onslaught of some of the worst people on the planet you can imagine coming to Hawaii with absolutely no regard for the host culture, the culture um, or the Aina or Keikai. It, it's, it's so disheartening for a lot of us that work in these traditional areas or that do environmental conservation. Boy, if there's one message we could get out is don't come here if you're not gonna respect it because it is it, it has not been a good walk this past year for us, except for the seven months the island was closed, right? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Because you've, you've, you've been here 80 years, I've only been here 30, so yeah. Well, 80 years ago was, was pleasant, but today is completely different that, you know, Different people come, change everything. They don't, they don't obey. You tell them don't do that. They tell you you don't own it, you know. And they're right because it's the state's property. But we grew up with respect, you know. Our parents always told, told us that always respect. If you go to a different area, you respect the place and you respect the people. They said, you know, if you don't know anything about the area, look for an old kupuna or anybody and ask them about the place, you know, how you can be there uh, and be likable. But today, there's no more stuff like that. You know, people just walk in, they don't care. You will see things they throw in all over the place, but, you know, that's okay. That's, that's, I think that's life, you know, it's, life goes on in a different manner every time, every year, you know. For us, we, we live the, really protective life and grow up in our manner that our parents and our owners taught us. Yeah, and it's also hard to teach. One of the things I think, having been in this for the 30 years with uncle and getting being privileged enough to live in a um, Ohana Lavaya, a fishing family that's a thousand years generation here in Hawaii. Um, there's so much, and there's a huge movement. I know Merv was in Hawaii Conservation Conference. So a lot of us present every year here. And they have a big Olela Hawaii track that's only done in Hawaiian as well. But I think it's that what we're trying to get across to people, especially I'm, I'm an educator, Chucky's an educator, is that inside their heads, it's this knowledge isn't just about net making or fishing. It has the whole concept through what we call kapu. They're, they're taught kapu. They're taught that there's times of the year you don't do this. So like Chuck off the top of his head, he fishes 18 different types of fishing. It, these guys were taught so that each time there was a change in the season, they knew what kind of fish to catch to provide for their village. Um, or if something happened to one and it wasn't producing that year, they would jump onto this type of fishing. Um, that's what's lost, right? That's what we lose when these guys pass away. And, um, you know, so for me as an, as an historian and an archivist and educator, I desperately for 30 years have been trying and trying and trying to document as much as we can with University of Hawaii with the Kula, with the schools that we teach in. Um, now with the First Nations Loose Foundation Fellowship funding, that's gonna help us a lot with actually doing video and books and things like that, that hopefully will preserve it. So yeah, I don't, I don't see any other questions, Merv. I don't know if you have any for uncle. Yeah, I have a question. And you know, the, my, my, my presentation uh, at the uh, Hawaii Conservation Conference uh, is, is something I've been working on with several uh, colleagues uh, 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 out in Indian country. Uh, and what was important uh, uh, for us was the idea that everything is related, right? We are all related to the uh, inanimate, the animate, the human, the non-human. Uh, and because of that, we have certain obligations to certain kuleana, to, to our family. Uh, so much of what we, uh, 
we, we do in modern society is about processes. Uh, it's about uh, uh, products. It's about uh, let's say production, and it misses the kind of relationship. the The relationships are are kind of transactional, right? I we have a contract. I fulfill that contract. Uh, I get paid by you. Well, that's not how it used to be. It used to be familial kind of relationships. It wasn't tra just transactional. It was because, you know, we were tied together. We were linked together. Can, can you say something about the, that, that kind of, uh, the loss of uh, those kinds of relationships? So I think, Marie, you talk about like, you know, when I first moved here 30 years ago, everybody really is auntie, uncle, cousin, grandparent. Is, is that kind of what you mean? Where, you know, I think about that. I think like in the old days, Chuck, the village was all family. They, they're, everybody was blood related. The cocoa was all there, right? So how is that different than what you see today where it's kind of like interrupted by this and diluted, right? To a degree where you lose that, that kinship. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's no longer f familial kind of relationship, but strictly it's like the godfather. It's, it's just <laughs> business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, today it's different, really different. But you know, when when we go and I meet all my old friends, we all go back to those days, you know. You can relate to those those times. But when you're with the younger generation, you cannot relate to them those times because they don't know anything about us, those times that we grew up, you know. But it's, it's a hard thing to to look at today, you know, but for me, I just, you know, whatever happens, happens, you know, you try to teach these young guys a little bit different things. And if they get it, they get it. If they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it, you know, and just let it bypass. You know, <laughs> you know it is sad though, Merv, because we, we taught this last summer. So Laiopua is a, um, that's the Hawaiian homesteads in Kailua Kona where we live. And they actually, the last year and a half, they have this really great program they've started. They built a double hole canoe. They've had, they actually do a teaching program. So uncle and I were teaching in the program. So we taught for one week back in Kailua Kona and then for one week down here in South Kona. And I think what was frightening is not a single one of those kids in the program in Keala Kehe even knew some Hawaiian words like panai right, which means adopted or joined, right? These basic Hawaiian words, they have zero, they're so what we call oki, the oki, the cut. They're so cut off from their, um, their culture in town because it's, it's, there's just nobody there anymore. You know, they're living sort of this, I go to Target, I go here, I shop here, or I go, you know, the beach maybe, but they don't live anymore. They've been so displaced. The native Hawaiians have been so displaced by people like me coming here or people buying second homes or doing vacation rental. The housing prices, I think in Kona and Kona, the district of Kona now, the average housing price is $956,000. I don't know anybody who lives here that can afford that. Um, so they get displaced. Luckily we have Hawaiian homelands for them to go on, but by being displaced from the beach areas and all these traditional areas, they're losing their sense of identity. And I'm sure that's pretty classic for any indigenous group, especially when we look on the mainland with Native Americans being displaced and what happened. And we, they had the same thing here where they were not allowed to speak Hawaiian and not allowed to do this. But down in South Kona, we're still small enough where these kids still speak some Hawaiian. They live by the beach. The families still have Kuleana parcels by the beach or have owned houses for so long that they're here. So that I think there's that little piece of hope and there's a lot of us working really hard on all levels to make sure that doesn't disappear, right? Um, and there's somebody who's asking, you know, I'm harping on tourists, I'm sorry, because some people that come here are really great. Can tourists experience a fishing tour with educators? Right now, educators kind of don't want anything to do with tourists. We're so over with COVID and the travel exposure and stuff that we're really, 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 at this point, um, I think there's Pacific Whale Foundation over on Maui that runs some things, especially during whale season, but on this island, nobody does that. The only educating, educated tours would be the ones that are being done for the schools. Um, do you think there is a way that younger generations can learn to be more familial, even to people they're not blood related to? Well, I know we all try to teach that, right? 
to be kind and respectful and that what do you feel their way <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a way you know you can talk and talk and talk and if they don't listen it doesn't make anything help you know? but to us when we we're growing up you know we get one one chance you know there's no second chance you you, you either learn the first time or you don't learn it they're not going to come back and teach you again. You know? yeah. It's a different, different way of living. It's the way I see it today. But you know, we just got to hope for the best. You know? Oh, yeah. So UH Hilo, um, actually, about 15, 16 years ago, my, my kumu is Kalani Forest. So Kalani and his wife, Pua Case, were big with the Mauna movement. But Kalani was great. Um, when we were, when I was in school taking Hawaiian studies, Hawaiian language, um, Kalani was great. He came down and did some documentation of Uncle with parts of the net and got it on film. Um, and UH Hilo, we really haven't, they had, they used to have certification tracks for Levaya and Mahi Ai and Hula. They don't think they do that anymore. There's just more directed focus in degree programs, but not for Levaya. Um, and it doesn't mean that UH Hilo doesn't try. There are other people besides us that are out there that I'm sure they're talking to. Um, you know, they're very focused on. Uh, language preservation. Hale Kuumo'o is the school at UH Hilo, and they are phenomenal. They're, I think they're even better than UH Manoa in, in what they've been able to do to preserve language, but not so much our traditional other practices. Um, best way for people to support our work? Well, it's, it's a hard thing to support our work is, um, you know, for us, the hardest part is finding people that want to do it, right? And there's not a lot of support people can do for that, you know? Um, what's your... How can people support you, Uncle? They're asking how they yeah. can support your work. <laughs> yeah, he's really blank. We work for so long doing what we call manuahi, which is free, right? Because when it came as a calling for Chuck, I sat down and tried to like develop these teaching programs to teach something that had never been taught outside of a family and isn't supposed to be taught like that. It should just be one-to-one, -one, right? Passed from generation to generation. So it's modified, but um, you know, we just, I. We, the recognition in Hawaii didn't happen because we're not really good at playing the financial ball game, right? Neither of us were both full time at what we do. We still fish. So the first recognition uncles ever had financially was First Nations this last year. Um, so First Nations and the Loose Foundation, I mean, God bless them because they saw something um, that they wanted to support that not many people had wanted to. And so that's been really, 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 um, important to us yeah i think yeah and we were laughing because um I, some of you if you're familiar with hawaii one of the people we serve on a lot of networks with is auntie hannah springer and hannah was great because i said to me like well you know i can't believe we actually had to go out of the islands to finally find some financial support and she was well no you forgot iolani luahine the famous hula dancer actually had to go to paris before people recognized her i said well she grew up the house right behind us right so chuck and i laughed it must be something about those of us from napo'opo'o down here we have to go the weird way to get our finding our, our financial funding but but you know even if you don't somebody wants to learn they don't have to pay me you know i just i just teach them and then watch what if he really want to learn or she really want to learn you know i just teach them that's it's two hours it's nothing much but it's 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 really hard to mm teach people sometimes. That's a great question. They want to know, um, can you explain a bit about the apprenticeship program and how you plan um, how you plan to start to identify the next generation of fishermen? You know, what you want to do. So yeah, basically this is what, we're, this is the stage we're at with building our homeschool and finding apprentices. So what's your plan? Well, right now I'm going to, I got three people that, well, two of my nephews, three of my nephews, one of my cousin and two nephews know how to do making a pillar net. So I, I'm gonna teach them, they're gonna come back to the school and I'm gonna look, I'm gonna teach five people. Like I noticed even with them, when they were making their net, they always have to come back to me because they get, they get stalled off. They cannot you know, move on with some places they get stuck. And then, so I said, if, if I can get five people learning how to do the net and if any, I'm gone, anyone needs to get help, they can go to one another and help them get, get this whole thing going. 
to so they can keep it moving ahead. And then as they go along, they can start teaching too. You know, I, I'm making sure that as they go along, they need to start teaching, not only keep it to themselves, but they need to make it keep moving on. If they, the time comes and they got these kids, these other younger generation uh, up ready for taking that on again, father. Yeah. I think one of the things we're also planning um, is, so uncle is trained to fish over about 40 miles of coastline here. So he knows all these koa. So we're gonna do a little project with the Nature Conservancy and document the different koa. And then that'll be a private file that's only shared with each individual village so that each village, the practitioners there can kind of look at what uncle's Ike is about the koa, if it, it connects with some of theirs. And, um, you know, I think also we've had some mentorships at Ehunui that we've done right with the, the different fishing villages. And so, you know, the other thing is just you know, I, I did this for Uncle one time. I figured out he makes about a dollar an hour. <laughs> so there's not a lot of people that want to jump on that wagon as a career or, an, you know, a lifestyle. Um, you know, you're up at two in the morning. He's on the koa by five in the morning. He's home by seven or eight. He's offloading fish. He's delivering fish. He's done by about three o'clock, gets ready for the next day. You know, so it's a, it's a hard, it's actually a hard life. Um, and then you know, the pressures from trying to get in and out of these different areas where we fish, the ingress, egress areas are so crowded with tourists swimming and blocking the parking. You know, there's a big struggle here, um, I think. But the apprenticeship thing, I think, you know, one of the things Uncle realized is that just not one person anymore could can learn all this. So the idea is with five apprentices, if somebody forgets one part of the net you've taught them, one of these other four is gonna remember. And, and even if Uncle's not with us anymore, these five people together can actually hold Hold the basket right full of knowledge and be able to to teach it yeah that's kind of the goal yeah you know that and reaching out to we really like the young kids can be kind of hard to teach just because of the energy level but we had a really good experience teaching this summer with lot um you know realizing how badly the um kanakama ole the keiki need this in their lives you know because we don't ever really you're not allowed to have any social media when we're teaching you don't bring in your cell phones nothing like that is allowed when we teach um, it is down the line if there's something they want to document as they're learning so if they take it home and are trying to make net right but it's it's hard it's just really hard this is such a silent tradition even when you look up the historical records you don't talk to the fishermen you don't look at the fishermen because you're going to bring him hard luck and he's trying to feed you what we also try to teach, really I think is important, are the kupuna values, right? Like when you catch right. fish, 10% of that fish goes to the people before you sell it, right? You feed your village first. You feed the people at the pier who help you um, bring the boat in. Um, you give opelu to the guys out there who come by that are going to go try to catch ahi or ono. That, you know, we try to remind people that, one, it's respect, two, it's patience, and three, it's kekahi i kekahi. Malama kekahi i kekahi. You take care of each other. So that, Merv, that's kind of too like that familial thing is kekahi i kekahi is a big, big one. Right, because that, see, that's getting to the, 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 the heart of, of, of my question, because see, if, if we think of fishing as about fish, then we're missing a whole bunch of stuff. Because if it's only about the fish, uh, then the, the best way to do it is to figure out what's the most efficient, the most effective, uh, most economical way of, of, of catching the, that fish, because it is a product uh, that it has economic uh, uh, value. And so the quicker we can catch it, the cheaper we can catch it, the, the better off my bottom line is going to be. But from an indigenous perspective, it's a hell of a lot more than about fish as an economic value. And that is the kind of stuff that is in, in a very, uh, it's kind of hard to put in a curriculum because as Chuck said, you know, you come on the boat and you listen to me and you watch what I do. And that becomes then that kind of a, a kind of a, 
uh, immersive <laughs> teaching, right? Because you start learning about kuleana. You start understanding about obligation, uh, about respect, et cetera. So yeah, it's, uh, for me, what you guys are doing is really important, uh, you know, and the, uh, if it gets in the book, that's fine. But, but it's, it's, it's about the relationship between the kumu and the, 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 the uh, haumana. You know, that's, that, that student mentor relationship becomes a familial thing. And I, I think that's what's important about that kind of hands-on, uh, listen to what I say, watch what I do, uh, uh, kind of uh, thing that you guys are doing there. Yeah, yeah, it's fun because, um, you know, like when uncle walks in, like especially when we're able, we, we taught a little bit at Avenue at the end of this last school year, when there was a little lapse in COVID, we could go back and work with the sixth grade teacher. And when uncle walks in a room, there's immediate respect, right? These kids, they, sh they come out, they get quiet, right? They don't ever back talk him. So a lot of the, the, the Hawaiian kids still have that, especially where we live in South Kona. They understand like when a kapuna, when an elder walks into a room, it's instant respect, instant quiet, right? Which is good to see. Haven't quite figured that out in some of these other schools when they walk in. He just walks in and they're all gabbing and doing their own thing. They're missing that piece that these other kids still have where we live that isn't taught anymore in the family because the families are they just don't practice this stuff anymore, right? They're so far removed, but um, yeah. Yeah, Merv, it's, you know, I, I want, it's, it still can be so depressing sometimes, especially when you get away from, you know, you're in the school going, oh my God, why do we even do this anymore? But, um, you know, it's, you get the, the, you'll get a group of Haumana or students that are so excited to learn this and so excited to learn the net because, you know, there's something in it, you know, when we did this last year with the Jefferson School and we were with educators who do bead work, right? Do they do bead work? And we were talking about the intricacies of, we all know hand brain connection, right? So doing this is way different than actually sewing and working with um, like these nets that we do. And, you know, now when we teach, there are things we bring in like, you know, the maka or the eye of the net right, the eye of each net, it's the strength of the maka is the strength of your cultural foundation. If you pay attention to all corners of it and you build it according to the right size, you catch what you want, you don't catch what you don't want. There's no wasted effort. Um, it's that attention to detail because as we put, you're feeding people, right? So if you don't catch fish, your village doesn't eat. You know, we're trying to get that through to kids like when we taught and you're teaching that and you're telling stories, but we actually have like a hard drive with hours and hours of footage of some of these old fishing trips and stuff. And the Okule, like when you see the movie, that's actually Okule fishing that we're doing in the Bay. We have lithographs from the early 1800s showing that same thing happening. But um, what was fun was get to show the kids, we call a sea mountain trip. So they go out and they're catching ahi, they're hand lining ahi. And the deck is covered in blood and they're clubbing fish and they're, and, you know, I just warned the kids, I said, now you guys got it ready. We're going to see some blood, but this is where your fish comes from, right? There's a disconnect too, as we all know, from um, getting everything from the grocery store versus being responsible for what you grow and raise and eat. Yeah. There's, because then you don't realize how important it is the work that the Levaya, the fishermen or the mahi ai or the farmer do for you, right? And I guess, Merv, you know, up until the 1950s, when it really started to change, I think, Chuck, that's how you guys all live. There was the whole yeah, Malcolm Mackay trade thing going on, right? We just, you know, farmers, we trade with the farmers and the ranchers and all that. You give them fish, they give you vegetables and stuff. It was really, you know, no, no money involved, just, you know, trading products that we caught. So that, that, was, that was a life that never, I don't think you'll see that coming back anymore. Nowadays, you go down to the harbor. I was talking to one of my friends. He said, man, I was down there and this guy came in with Opelu and this old kupunas told him all, what do you get Opelu? Yeah, yeah. What, how many pounds you like? He never even offered 10 Opelu or five Opelu. How many pounds you like buy, you know? Because <laughs> <laughs> usually when somebody, 
old people come around. You don't even wait for them to ask. Right. You make a bag and they tell them, here, this, you take home for this, you know. But, it's all transactional. Yeah. But <laughs> they, they, everything in their head is money, money, money. Eh? Oh, yeah. So, you know, when Uncle, right. like, I love it when we go fishing um, and the guys help Uncle come out. He always gives them, he has bags of Opelu. So he hands them off to the guys that back the truck up or help him do things. And then the next day when he comes back in from fishing, there'll be pumpkin, papaya, banana, all this food sitting in his truck for him, right? So that trade happens still. But um, we had a question come up from Montoya. Are women, young girls showing interest in fishing and continuing traditional fishing technique and knowledge? Yeah. Um, so there are three of us that about 20 years ago, you would, uh, the Kai man, right? The person who was helping uncle on the boat. It was me with uncle and then his cousin and his cousin's daughter, Tammy, and then his nephew and his wife, um, Kaliko. So we always used to joke about the Wahine out there learning. And, you know, when I first started with Chuck, I was like, do any, many, do, are there any women in your fish family that fish? And he was like, no, no, women don't fish. And then I found this picture of his mom and she's over at Ka'avaloa where her family was from. And she's holding a big spear in her goggles from the 1920s. I was kind of like, what's that? And he goes, oh yeah, mama fish. So <laughs> actually, actually some of the best net makers and one of our students that we mentored last year was a woman, it was a girl. And um, you know, for the most part, Montoya, women have that ability to do the crafts, right? You know, either through knitting or sewing or something, they have the dexterity. And for the most part, I think they can have a lot more focus than the Kane. Yeah, yeah. My mom was a good net maker. Too. Your mom made that? Yeah, she yeah. made that. Yeah. And, and that girl that we had in school, she was just amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Loya Alani. Yeah. You know, we've been trying to connect our villages. And actually, Chuck is like in whole Canada, I think there's one or two families that make net, but some of them they don't, they make them in old style. And then Mililii Fishing Village doesn't have any net makers anymore. So this last year, uncle made two nets for them in Mililii for their program. And then um, I think it's Pa'apono is the name. Pa'apono, Pa'apono is the name and it's Mililii Fishing Village with Kaimi Kaupiko. Um, and then for Loea Alani, the Alani family are, are Opelu fishermen too, but um, they don't really know how to make net very well. So yeah, yes on women. <laughs> um, so Loea was like, it was incredible to actually sit down as the first young student we've had who made net like uncle did she was patient she took her time and i know in the picture if you can in the film if you can see when uncle joins these pieces because we don't make eye for eye anymore when we join the pieces it's just there's no we don't use a um we call it una or a haha or spacer when opelu is made opelu nets made it's generally your eye by eye and she was just so brilliant you could see right off the bat she had this and it you know to us it's like it's in the dna you just have to draw it out right and she went on and the net she made in our mentorship program, um, we made a shortened net for her. She wanted to make a net to teach this to students. And so we dyed it different colors for each part of the net so that she could, could demo that. So that was, you were pretty stoked about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah she, was, she was amazing. I look at her work sometimes and say, man, what happened? You got my, my, my hand too? Because she made them exactly like how I make my net. <laughs> it was just unbelievable, you know, I because we had, uh, I think, 14 students, 15 students, 15 yeah. students and everyone had all their eyes come all crooked, and but this girl had it just so perfect. Yeah, so we made her teach. <laughs> yeah, she, she was my helper. <laughs> we always figured that's great. That's the real sign is when you see the kids wanting to help and wanting to teach boy that's that's the gold right there as anybody who teaches knows that's the gold when you see them take it on the hard part i think in the hawaiian community is these kids you know from what we see is you know they they go through like an immersion school for 12 years they don't want to do it for a while they want to go out and become a flight attendant or they want to go travel or they a lot of go to las vegas or whatever um, eventually they kind of come back to it you know when they get into their mid-20s they're like yeah I don't really like that I kind of want to come home right I want to come home and then you see them start teaching or being interested in language or Uncle Chucky and that kind of stuff so um, yeah yeah I mean we both look at ourselves going uncle never thought he said this to the kids in the program this summer you know I never thought I would be a teacher right he just thought I was gonna die and um, I didn't ever think I'd be a teacher, right? In an immersion school, <laughs> I never think that. But um, I also see how important it is. Maybe others of you who are practitioners of any kind of 
older knowledge. It doesn't, you know, I mean, I always say cultural, but you know, hey, my my family were farmers, right? My dad knew amazing things about farming, right? So um, any culture, these, these, and I guess what's really cool is we're now teaching STEM. So there's a huge movement in Hawaii. I don't know how it is on the mainland, but in Hawaii, there's a huge movement to take these kapuna and the knowledge they have because inherent to that knowledge is conservation and environmental practices. It's all in there. And all you have to do is ask them, right? If you ask them and it's something they feel they can share, then that's what we do. So now we are in a lot of the schools here, especially on Hawaii Island. They do this, they do it on every island, but on our island, we're really working hard to develop these kapuna-based programs for STEM. Um, you know, so that when you go look at the ocean, what is uncle seeing versus what you're being taught in the textbook, right? You know, the, Herb Kane has a book out and it talks a little bit, it's an old book that shows like the different, different um, professions in Hawaiian culture. And there's a whole thing about looking at current and wind and waves or swell and birds and cloud formations because fishermen are also navigators. And I'll tell you, you know, he can make his way out from a hundred miles out. And we used to have a lot of bog. You couldn't see the island. He never worried about finding it because you know where your ground swell runs, you know where your wind swell runs, you know all these things. It's so in their heads that once you get them out there with the kids and asking the right questions from them, it's this wealth of knowledge carried within the culture and within the cultural practices, right? And, you know, Hokulea, the voyaging society that we work with, um, it, you know, Makali'i is on our island. The stuff that they did a couple of years ago when they went to Papahanao, Mokuakea, the um, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, they grew everything they took from fish, you know, to, well, not grew, caught fish, grew, grew food, and developed ways to preserve food without using preservatives. Like we were just at the blessing of that ba'a and um, the, the kalo, the tarot guys were there that had created the actual, we call ai holo, which is ai is food, holo is travel, like traveling food, your, your takeout food. But it was um, how you would pound taro, not to make poi, but to make ai holo, it's much drier and it lasts longer. And then you can take portions of it and add water to make poi. They rolled it in ulu flour. And I think the longest they got it to last was 16 days. So I, it's exciting for us to be involved with that. Like, you know, even the practices of, of brining and drying fish, you know, that's the USDA came in and shut down dried opelu, which is, you know, it's a salt brine. Anybody who dries anything knows how jerky, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, the USDA came in and shut it down. I mean, this is thousands of years with this process of brining and never made anybody sick and sun drying it. And all of a sudden you can't do that anymore. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot going on. I don't know, your turn. You just, he likes to sit here and let me talk because he doesn't like to talk. So I'm hoping if anybody has any other questions or Merv, if you want to pull something out of Chuck, that would be great. Well, uh, how, how much, what time do we have? Uh, oh, it's almost over. Oh, you, you got a few minutes. A few minutes, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, eight minutes. You know, the point that uh, you, you you made was, uh, for me, is what of a uh, an important point uh, because it's there is a uh, there is a need for people to ask the right questions of people like Chuck. See, you can watch, you can see, you can listen, but you need to have folks who can ask the right questions as well. And, and so there is a, uh, uh, I, I think a need for the kind of uh, education uh, that uh, uh, teaches uh, folks, if, if you will, how to be a good researcher with, with Native peoples, so that they are asking the, the, the right questions. Uh, you know, because it is, there's so much, of, 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 of so much knowledge that's you know, you can say it's part of the DNA, but it's part of uh, just uh, generations of oral history of, of 
dance of ceremony of, of uh, uh, Oli and that's there, but you gotta ask the right questions. Yeah. What, what, what do you, you know, Chuck, what, how do we get people to ask you the right questions? No, don't ask him. Uncle, <laughs> favorite question is, Uncle, what is your culture? And he just looks at him blank. That is the wrong question. Because it's oh, yeah, 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 that's yeah, that's right. then you already know, like, oh, that goes that one. But we, so, <laughs> we live our culture, you know, we don't you are the culture. We right? are the culture. So it's it's hard to ask you what you mean in your culture. What do you think though? Murph asking you what kind of questions can people ask you that help you draw out what you know? You know, they, they can ask a lot of different questions and one little question gonna hit you that you don't know, draw everything out, you know. It doesn't have to be a specific question to that specific thing that person talking, but if we listen to them asking and then we can categorize it that, oh, this is what they wanna know. This is what we gonna do. This is how, how we do it. Yeah, you know, um, so what was I thinking? Teaching people to be willing to sit and listen to the story. You know, they ask and want this question answered quickly. That might be a three hour question answer, right, Merv? Because there's right. a story, there's a big story and they have to tell the story and you have to be willing to go on the journey with them as a researcher and a listener. And if you're not gonna go on that, you're not gonna get the answer. It's like, you know, we had our first shark attack in Kealakekua Bay a couple of years ago in oral or recorded history, right? Because there's a lot of mo'olelo or story about, even from Chuck's family, about um, the shark relationship and the protection because of practices. And so um, that uncle was like, he said to me, well, you know, we have a protocol for that. I said, you do? And sure enough, there was a protocol, but it's not something that would come out unless it needed to happen. Yeah. So, you know, it's, for me, it's being willing to sit with the kapuna. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, salt cultivators. Yeah, Mahalo. One of the people just piped on and they um, do pa'akai, right? Salt. Pa'akai, stuck ocean, right? Um, from Hana Pepe. Hey, we have some salt from Hana Pepe. So great to see somebody from the islands. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing with people outside of Hawaii. Yeah, it's really important. You know, hey, the Kanaka, there's a lot of Kanaka out there. You guys have some responsibility where you are like Merv to spread this stuff out there, right? You, and you know what I find? It helps you guys tie back to your culture by helping us, right? By showing it to other people. Yeah, I think, right, Uncle? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. And oh, mahalo to the tech guys. I Yeah, I mean, I feel for you because I had like zero tech experience. I was like, oh, maybe we should we'll just turn it off and talk story, but mahalo for getting it back on, yeah, and making the link available, yeah. Yeah, so again, we're so sorry about that. I'm putting in the chat again, the YouTube link. Uh, if anyone would like to watch the film again, or if there's anyone in your life you'd like to share it with. Um, and then I will also put in a link to uh, our next program on September 8th. Um, and yeah, thank you so much everyone for coming. It's such an honor to have uh, our presenters here tonight. I uh, mostly learned how little I know tonight is what the, my main takeaway was. But uh, this was really wonderful. And I was wondering, any final thoughts before we say goodnight? Well, one, thank you for yeah, being willing to yeah, show this film and host us. Because for some reason, we've got this great connection with Denver now, with Merv and you guys and, <laughs> and First Nations and everybody. So um, we really want to malama that and build that pilina, that relationship with you guys. So mahalo, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mahalo. You see, it's, it's, it's not transactional. <laughs> it's familial. So, what's for supper? <laughs> oh, I don't know. What you Uncle's probably already eaten by now. He, uh, I, before we before we close, uh, I, I I I really do want to thank uh, uh, you guys for, uh, for for joining us and uh, you know uh, engaging in this uh, in this conversation. And uh, uh, we've got uh, representatives from. Uh, uh, Kumalao, who have been, uh, uh, I guess, their relations or uh, uh, 
you, you know them, Lisa and uh, <sighs> Jennifer uh, Kasani from from Kumala. We really want to. Who's that? Lynette. Yeah. Oh, was Lynette on? I don't know if she was on. But... Oh, oh, and, and, and Lynette as well. Uh, uh, they've, they've been real great supporters of uh, our work with, and uh, they helped uh, uh, make this program possible. So mahalo to them as well. All right, wonderful. And thank you for traveling those hundreds of miles <laughs> virtually um, to present all this and everyone who came. And I think that's the end of our program. Good night, everyone. Aloha. 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 Aloha.